Well, good afternoon, evening, everyone. Good morning, afternoon. You know, it's so good to have everyone. Welcome to the Legacy Weekend. We're so thrilled and honored that you came here to be with us this weekend. Hi, and we just want to welcome you to our house. This is Impact Life Church, and you know what? Our heartbeat here is that you belong here. So we want you to know whether you came all the way from Holland or South America or just Black Falls or Penhold, we want you to know you belong here. We're glad you joined us. It's going to be an amazing weekend. Be awesome. You bet. So just before we kick it off, why don't you just say hello to somebody real quick next to you? Man, we want to just make sure everybody, you got a chance to say hi real quick.
thank you. You are good. You only do good, and we praise you this evening. You know, I just, I'm so thankful that we have the greater one that lives on the inside of us. Like, he's not out there somewhere, strong out there somewhere. Where is he strong? Right on the inside. He's strong right in here. So if you need strength, don't look for anything external. It comes right on the inside of you. Right on the psalmist says that in, and he's ordained praise through the mouth of babes, and he's ordained strength for you and I. Where does our strength come from? It comes from just really encouraging ourselves in the Lord. It comes from giving praise to whom praise is due. That's where it comes from. So listen, we got a really good opportunity to get some strength. You're feeling a little drained, oh, it's Friday night. Oh, no, 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 let's, let's get strong. How do we do that? We lift up Jesus. So if we just do that for a moment, I want you just to set your mind, set your eyes on him. Jesus, our eyes are on you, the author and the finisher of our faith. Lord, we give you praise. We give you glory. You know, I'll just, you know, this this coming to my heart. First Samuel 30, you know what David was, he lost all of his, I mean, he came back from war with his mighty men and the, all of their wives were gone, their children were gone, their place was burnt. So David, everybody, they cried until they cried till there was no more tears left. Now, that's a lot of crying, right? Did it do anything for them? No, they were just drained. But then it says, David, he encouraged himself in the Lord. What does that mean? He just had to use his mouth to start encouraging, who is he to me? Well, he's the strength of my life. He is my hiding place. He is my refuge. He is my joy. That's who he is. And he started acknowledging what happened. Then he inquired, Lord, what do I do? He said, go get him. Go, go kick some Phyllis or go kick some butt. Well, off he went and kicked some butt and he got everything back. How it just comes from this praise. That's where it begins. We want to see victory, but before that, it comes praise. We serve a good God. And he loves you. Amen. Well, we're so glad that you're here. We're going to have an awesome weekend. I mean, this is this is evening one, and it only gets gooder from here. So you may go ahead and say hello to somebody real quick, and you may be seated. Awesome. Well, hello, everyone, again. We're so glad that you're here. How many of you are glad you came this this evening? Woo! Well, we're thrilled that you could come be with us. I mean, we got a lot of pastors here as well. We want to welcome you guys. We're going to see you a lot again tomorrow in Leaders, tomorrow morning. So there's some that came from Manitoba, from Quebec, from Holland. Woo! From Calgary, from South America. Oh, there's so many languages. We're all, I'm so glad you all speak English because I don't know what I do. Oh, hola. Hoy is Dutch. All right, and uh, for Quebecois, bonjour. And for Manitoba, what do you guys speak in Manitoba? Is that, what, what is that again? It's, it's a mixture. It's a mixture of things. <laughs> no, we're so glad that you guys are here. Uh, we're thrilled. It's G German or something like that. But we're thrilled that you're here. You know, just before we, we, uh, we call up our dear friends, Brother and Jeremy and Sarah, and also Jordan and Courtney are here too as well to join us. They come as well part of Pearson Ministries. We're thrilled that you guys are here as well. Uh, I want to just share something with you. We've been spending a lot of time, I mean, weeks before this meeting came, us as a team, we have an amazing leadership team that have put, done a lot of work in prayer, but also in just natural labor. So I just want to say thank you to everyone that has just put the time in to make this place what it is. Uh, just thank you. And we, we spent a lot of time in prayer as well. Yeah, and I, I want to just share something with you uh, that the Lord just put on our hearts for, for this coming weekend and what to, just to get our expectation up. I know it's good that we come to hear, hear a word of the Lord, to come and hear what God wants for us. But we want to put our expectors out. What, Lord, what are we expecting for this meeting? What are you here for? What are we expecting this weekend? Because it's, it's good to be ready for something. And I just wanted to hear, just to tell you what the Lord just shared with me this, uh, this, this afternoon, but also later this, earlier this week. Uh, it says, you're here to hear the word of the Lord. There's nothing more valuable, nothing more important than hearing the word of God impact your life. So in prepping for this weekend, this verse came to my heart, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 17. It says, don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. I know there's lots in that about being filled with the Spirit. But he said, I heard the Lord say, because you've taken and set aside this time to hear him, to be filled with his word, you're placing yourself in a place called in the know. Those are just the three words the Lord gave me for this weekend for, for you as an individual, maybe for you as a pastor, as a leader, or as a ministry leader, or a businessman, or just part of a family, is to be in this place called being in the know. There's nothing better than being in the know. Wouldn't you agree? I mean, what's the opposite? Not knowing. That's a very frustrating place to be. Anybody ever been in the not know? <laughs> what do you do? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. But when you know what to do, what happens? You act. You know what to do. You respond and you're quick to do things because you know what you're supposed to be doing. 
So this, this, uh, this weekend, I want to encourage you, if you are in need to be in the know about some things, personal decisions, family decisions, ministry decisions, or job decisions, stop trying to figure it out in your mind. Stop it right there. And as you intentionally place your focus and attention on what the Lord is saying this weekend, you will see it and you will hear it. Proverbs 20, verse 12, it says, I love this in the New Living, it says, ears to hear, eyes to see, both are gifts from the Lord. So the Lord has given us the equipment to know. All we have to do now is simply believe and agree with what he said. He said, I give you eyes to see. I give you ears to hear. So what do we say? I have eyes to see. I have eye, ears to hear. I'm in the know. That's what I've been, we've been saying this, this past week. We are in the know. Everybody that's part of these meetings, you are in the know. So if you're like, what am I supposed to be doing? Oh, I know it. I may not know it right now. I know it, but I got it. Right? So can we just say them? I have ears to hear. Wait, I said that wrong. Don't confess that. You don't have eyes that hear. That'd be wrong. I have eyes that see. I have ears that hear. A heart that understands. And I am in the know. Amen. I believe that for you and I. We're going to have it this weekend. So without further ado, would you give us, give us the honor? Let's stand up and we want to just welcome Brother Jeremy and Miss Sarah as they come to minister to the word of the Lord this evening. everybody. Thank you for coming tonight. This is going to be an awesome weekend. We're super excited. Let's just take a minute and honor the Lord. I know we already have some tonight, but you know, it's so good to look back and to remember what God has done for you. You know, all through the word, you see this concept of remembering or using your memory when you worship God or recalling, bringing back to your mind the goodness and the good things that he has done for you so just take a minute with me we're going to close our eyes and just if you have to go back and dig it up <laughs> if you've forgotten how good he's been to you i just want to take a minute and thank the lord enter his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise father we do love you so much tonight we honor you we worship you You've been so good to us, so faithful to us. Not one word has failed that you have spoken, and your word is true. You cannot lie, and you are faithful to watch over it and perform it in our lives. Lord, we want to remember, look back and remember how you provided for us, Lord every need you've met. Lord, how you've given us wisdom when we've needed wisdom. You've given us strength when we needed strength. How many times have you healed us? How many times have you healed our babies? You are faithful. You're wonderful. And we do love you tonight. Stand here amazed in all of your kindness, Lord, your love on display. I have tasted, I have tasted. 
person in this room right now and Lord I ask you I know I believe that you stretch forth your hand to heal and right now Lord we believe we receive your healing anointing flowing down from the top of our head to the soles of our feet quickening us strengthening us bringing us life and peace and joy oh we thank you for it Lord Oh, you're so good, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for loving us. Thank you for healing us. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Just say thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Faith says thank you. Oh, we thank you, Lord. Lord, we just let it wash over us. From the top of our heads, the soles of our feet. Oh, we thank you for it, Lord. Oh, your life. Your words are spirit in their life. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Oh, I give you glory, Lord. Oh, you're wonderful, Jesus. Oh, thank you, Lord, for moving.
gracious to us, Lord, and we love you. We love you. We love you. We love you. We thank you. We worship and adore you, Father. <clears throat> you know, I think there's probably no other statement, no, no other thought, no other word that you and I could say that would more define us as a family than what Sarah has just ministered to us. No matter what I see, no matter what I feel, I trust you. I think those words right there define you and me as a family, the family of faith, the household of faith. And sometimes I think we are that family. And not just that family, we are that side of that family. Every family's got that side of the family. We don't know really much about them. We don't, we don't understand that side. They, they, we're not quite sure how they're related. <laughs> There's paperwork to prove it, but beyond that, we don't really get them. And sometimes I think that's who we are. And you and I, as faith people, is that who I'm talking to tonight? Faith people? Sometimes I think that's who we are. Of course, we're a part of the global body of Christ, the family of God. He is our father. We are his children. And this family is everywhere. We've already said hello to a bunch of people from different parts of the world, all part of the same family. Christians, born again believers. But as faith people, and when I say faith, I don't just mean the acknowledgement of a higher being. I don't just mean an adherence to certain principles or values. When I say faith, I mean that. No matter what I see, no matter what I feel, I'm going to take God at his word. I'm going to say I'm healed whether I feel it or not. I'm going to say I'm prosperous whether I see it or not. That's just me. That's just how we do it on this side of the family. And I'm going to tell you something. Daddy likes it. He's really into it. And as a matter of fact, you can't please him without that. Without that attitude right there, there is no pleasing him. Without that conviction that no matter what I see or feel, I don't live based on what I see. I don't live based on what my five physical senses tell me. I live based on what I believe, and I believe God. I believe His Word. That's how I live, and it's how I will die, believing God. And He likes it. He really likes it. He likes faith. And that, I believe, defines us more than anything. People who trust. And they call it blind faith, but that's not, it's not blind at all. It's not blind at all. It's just seeing the invisible. It's just seeing what you can't see with these natural eyes, but it is still seeing. It's eyes, just like the pastor mentioned to us a moment ago, eyes that see Jesus, ears that hear his voice. There's nothing blind about this. Are you kidding me? Nothing blind about it. Thank you, Lord. Father, we do love you. We do worship you tonight. And we make this declaration as a family before you that regardless of what the circumstances tell us, regardless of what the flesh feels like, regardless of what it looks like, what it feels like, Lord, we trust you. And your word said that you're a shield to those who trust you. So we do ask you for an increased grace, an increased measure of grace to trust you more than we ever have before. Father, I'm asking you to help us identify areas in our lives tonight where we have withheld trust, where we have looked to ourselves as our own source, our own strength, our own supply. Help us identify that, Holy Ghost. Holy Spirit, you have free reign in here to open up our eyes, to open up our ears, to open up our hearts, to help us see places where we can trust and trust more, trust and trust deeper, trust and trust further than we ever have before. We're ready. 
We're excited about it. We're the family of faith. We are faith people in here tonight. We are faith children of a faith God. And as we come boldly before your word, Lord, I'm asking you once again, in agreement with Pastor Joel and the leadership of this church, we believe we receive eyes that see, ears that hear, hearts that are open and ready to understand, ready to understand who Jesus is in us, who we are in him. And we thank you for change tonight, change that comes as the result of the anointing your anointing on your word ministered to your people under your grace by the help of your spirit. Lord, we're looking to you. We are looking to you tonight. We are so thankful for you, Father. I worship you and praise you. Give you all the glory in the name of Jesus. You agree with that? Well, shout amen then. Glory to God. What a pleasure it is to be with you guys tonight. Anybody happy to be in church on a Friday night? Let me tell you something. I'm going to tell you a couple of things. Let me tell you a few things. First of all, I'm Jeremy. This is my wife, Sarah. That guy right there is not Jeremy. <clears throat> when, when Sarah and I do get to travel with Jordan, her brother, and his wife, Courtney, uh, oftentimes the exact same thing happens that you saw happen tonight. Pastor Joel said, please welcome Jeremy and Sarah Pearsons, and Sarah comes up with that other guy, which is great with me. I'm fine with that, because for like 15 minutes, people sit there and think, man, that Jeremy guy is really cool. <laughs> Look how cool that guy is. Man, he's in shape, talented, plays the guitar, sings well. What a power couple. <laughs> and then I feel the need to stand up and be like, hi, everybody. <laughs> you know, it's me. I, you know. I do love my brother, though. Jordan, you're a good man. I love you, sir. We are so thankful that the Lord's given us people, Jordan and Courtney, especially, to do life with. And you got to have people to do life with. you got to have people to be on the adventure with you. Amen. And that's what we really see this as. This is an adventure. And just in the last few months, we've really started ministering to the partners of our ministry. And over the course of the weekend, I can <clears throat> excuse me, tell you a little bit more about that, but we've begun ministering to them recently on just the concept of being in this adventure together. <clears throat> you know, this world is made up of, what, almost 200 nations, over 7 billion people, thank you. But it's just one big adventure. That's all it is. And that's what we feel like we're on, is a big adventure. And this, this adventure has brought us to Red Deer. deer. Red Deer. deer. <laughs> I got to tell you this. This is so cool. Uh, last year, our, our little boy... Justice started kindergarten there uh, just north of Fort Worth, Texas. He just, as of last week, this week, just a couple of days ago, finished his first grade year. But in kindergarten, we took him to a new school, and uh, there was this little girl in his class, cutest little girl. And they just really kind of took a liking to each other. It was so sweet. And they would take pictures. We would stand there and take pictures with them, and they would just strike this pose, and she would just sort of lean into him and put her, put her hand right there. <laughs> on his chest, like, how long have you guys been married? I mean, this is not, this is not prom. This is kindergarten. Come on. This is the cutest, the two of them, the cutest little thing. And we got to know the mom and dad a little bit. And uh, she was asking us what we do, who we are, where we're talking to them, where are you from, and all that. And they had just moved uh, to Texas from California. And so I think we're asking, were you born originally in California? She said, no, originally I'm from Canada. Like, oh, what part of Canada? She starts telling us. She's like, it's this little place. You've never heard of it. It's called Red Deer. <clears throat> We're like, are you kidding? We've been there twice. And she was blown away. <clears throat> she couldn't believe it. She couldn't believe that anybody had actually heard of it, much less been to it. But we were, we just found this common bond right away. So it's a lot of fun. But we are so thankful to be back here with you guys and a part of this family. And I'm going to tell you something. And I don't care what anybody else says. I love Joel Housing. <clears throat> no, I'm kidding. I, 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 do, I do mean this with all sincerity. We love Joel and Jamie. We feel like the Lord has brought us special people, friendships into our lives. We count you guys among some of our closest friends. And even though we only see you, a couple of times a year. I think that's what it takes to be 
good friends with us, you know. <laughs> People who get more time with us, they're not as close to us for some reason. <laughs> But no, the Lord has really connected us with some wonderful people around the world. But it's a lot like this. They're around the world. Yeah. But we are still so thankful for them. And these are the kind of friendships we can go months and months and months without seeing each other. And the moment you see each other, it's like no time at all has passed. And we just know we're in this thing with you guys. And we believe you're in this thing with us. And uh, we're all in this jet together. <laughs> That's what I like to say as we travel. We are all in this jet together. So we believe in you. We believe in what God is doing in this place. We're so thankful for the heritage and the foundation that, that you guys are, are starting with and building on. John and Ingrid, just I, I, I went home the first trip from here telling Sarah, you've got to meet these people. They are so precious and so sweet. So we're just thankful. We love you guys so much. Have we gushed enough? Is that everybody good? Have you met your quota? Does everybody feel warm? Do you feel fuzzy? Good, I do. I feel all warm, it's like all kinds of fuzzy. <clears throat> Siri not available. I don't want to talk to Siri. <laughs> Smartphones. I think that should be in quote. No, you smart. It's like, give me directions home. Here are 12 Chinese restaurants in your location. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, smartphone. Did you bring a Bible with you tonight? Glory to God. Let's go together to the book of 3 John, Legacy Weekend. Anybody wondering what Legacy Weekend is all about? Yeah. A few of you? Okay, well, let's find out. I hope you can make plans to join us throughout the weekend because I really have it in my heart that this is going to really just ramp up over the next 24 to 48 hours. We are really just going to begin right now and excel and exceed in some things in God. And I believe he's going to start right now just expounding on some of the concepts that have become so dear to us and that we've built a ministry on and um, some, some things that are the heartbeat of who we are. And we're going to find some of that in here tonight. In 3 John chapter 2, or excuse me, 3 John, just one chapter, verse, verse 2. <clears throat> well, why not? Back up to verse 1. Notice what it says here. The elder... The elder. For the first time in my life, having read 3 John 2 for a very long time now, I don't know how long, but I've just sort of feels like I've grown up knowing it. You've know, you know this verse, verse 2, I pray above all things that you prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. But for the first time in my life over the last day or so, you know what has stood out to me in these verses here? The elder. Who's writing here? John, the elder. And this is John, the apostle, the disciple, the one who, of course, wrote the book of John and 1 John and 2 John and the disciple whom Jesus loved. And, and now we're at the winter time of his life. This book, scholars tell us, was written just in the closing days, maybe, of his life. Last few years, we don't know. And he lived probably to be somewhere in the neighborhood of 90, 95 years old. I think something like that. Good long life. And these are, these are words coming at the end of that time. The elder. And when you start talking about legacy, that's a word that really hits home, obviously, with Sarah and with me, with our ministry. We have built a ministry around that word, but not just that word, but what it means, the concept of it, what it communicates. And we've told people, congregations all over the world, we believe there are two kinds of legacies, the one you keep and the one you leave. And we believe that it's every generation's responsibility to serve as a bridge from the generation before them to the one that's coming after them. And what goes across that bridge... It's not so much people walking across that bridge, but in our mind and in our heart, it's revelation. It's revelation that the generations before us walked in and grew in and preached with and a fire that burned big in them. And in our case, we've got family, parents, grandparents, and so on that have been privileged to preach the word of God all over the world, and I say with all humility, have changed the shape and the face 
of the, of the world through the preaching of the gospel, through the revelation of how to live, how to walk by faith. And we have determined that we will be a bridge. Our lives will serve as a bridge from that generation to the one coming after us. And that revelation will stay alive. It will not pass away or die on our watch or in our time. Praise God. But when you start thinking like this and you start living like this, then you begin to develop, and it's not you developing it, it's the Holy Spirit in you developing such, the only word that comes to mind is an awe, maybe a reverence, perhaps just an honor for the elder, the ones that have gone before you. And the more you think about that, and you think about who's writing these words, the elder John, when you have an appreciation for those who, who refused to quit when opportunity came, because you know they had opportunity, don't you know? But they refused to quit in the face of it. They chose by making this resolute decision, I'm drawing the line in the sand of my own life and I will not retreat from the call of God and the assignment of God. And they fought through and they broke through and they persevered. And our lives are what they are because men and women of God made the decision, I won't quit. The elders. The elders. But there's something about the elder, and like we said, a man like John who is in the place in his life where he is right here and where he's writing from. You know, sometimes words themselves take on a totally different meaning depending on whose mouth they're coming out of. And I've found I can say something and then I can listen to somebody who's got more experience than me who's got more time under their belt, done a lot more living, seen a lot more stuff, been a lot more places. When they say it, for some reason, it just seems to carry more weight. And a lot of times as a young preacher, I spend a lot of times listening to other preachers, older preachers, and some of these guys, they're personal heroes of mine. And I listen to them say things. I think, you know what? I said that exact same thing last weekend in a church, but it didn't hit anybody the way it just did coming out of your mouth. There's just something that's intangible, irreplaceable, and cannot be counterfeited when it's coming out of somebody who has been there. How else do, how do you replace that? You don't. The Bible calls it experiential knowledge. There's a difference between just knowledge and experiential knowledge. So maybe you've heard me give this example before. It's okay with you. We just kind of flow in this tonight. I, I know where to start, but I don't know much beyond that. We'll find out. Won't it be fun? There, I've, I've given this example before, and it, I, I give it because it helps it make sense to me. The difference between knowledge and experiential knowledge. It'll make sense to you when I ask you this question. If I gave you the choice between two guys... And you can decide which one of these guys is going to fly the airplane that you're about to get in. And the first choice you have is a guy who has been flying airplanes for about four decades now. He started flying when he was a young guy, and he stuck with it and went into the military, and he started flying military aircraft and flying everything in the military inventory, and he's flying fast stuff. He's flying big stuff. He has seen every imaginable scenario. He's been through every emergency situation. He has been there, done that, lived to tell the story, landed on places you were never intended to land and walked away. I mean, this guy's got stories. He's got experience. He's got training. And now he's at a place in his life where he, he, whatever, he retired from military and went into commercial. And he's flown the biggest commercial jets all over the world. He's wrote the book on it. So there's your first choice. Your other choice is a guy who has seen Top Gun. <laughs> 
like a dozen times. <laughs> no, listen to me. He's seen it a bunch. It's fitting I say this. Did you hear Top Gun 2 is coming out? We won't get into that. <laughs> but seriously, I mean, he has seen all the airplane movies. He subscribes to like three different airplane magazines. He reads airplane books. Uh, if you were to point at a picture of an airplane, he could tell you what kind it was, tell you a lot of details about it, maybe. I mean, this guy, like we said, he's, he's seen some movies. He's read some books. Never actually been in an airplane. <laughs> Who do you want flying you home tonight? You want knowledge or you want knowledge with experience? You want experiential knowledge, right? Well, there's a big difference between knowledge of God and experiencing Him. And this man that said these words that you've heard so many times and I have too, this is a man, not just with knowledge of God, but an experiential knowledge with God. He's our elder. The elder John is saying these things. The elder <clears throat> to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. Now, the reason I said all that about John being the elder is I want these words that you're so familiar with to perhaps hit you in a way they never have before. He is saying, I pray, I pray above all things and in all things that you prosper in all things and be in health even as your soul prospers. Now, we have so taken this verse and isolated it and, and squeezed a lot out of it. Don't get me wrong. Some wonderful things have come out of this, some big revelation in the body of Christ and about God's willingness to prosper his people, his desire to prosper his people, his, his ability to prosper his people. But when it comes to prosperity, and I'm going to just say that, I'm going to say it boldly, and let me say it again. When it comes to prosperity, the reason I'm saying it like this is because I was visiting with a pastor some time ago from your nation here in Canada, another part of the country. And we're talking about some of these things, and he started telling me about how, you know, I, I, I can't really... I can't really preach it like that in my church. You know, I have to kind of sneak in the prosperity stuff sometimes because it's really different here in Canada. He starts telling me how difficult it is in Canada, how Canadians were just not really, they're not really open to that, and I have to kind of be sneaky about it. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I appreciate his perspective. I, I'm, not, I'm not the pastor of that church and certainly not trying to tell him how to do his business. I'm going to tell you something. We are not a Canadian church. We are not an American church. We're not an African or a European or an Asian church. We are the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is not a Canadian word or an American word or an English word or a Spanish word. This is the word of God. And there are some things... Now I'll stand right in front of your pastors and say this. There are some things that you and I as the next generation have got to commit ourselves to preaching and preaching boldly so that they stay alive. So that we do serve as that bridge from the ones before to the ones that are coming. Regardless of the whatever pressure we feel like it's met with, but listen, if we'll be bold enough to say some stuff, bold enough to deal with the persecution that comes as a result of it, we'll have some things that not everybody else has. We will experience some things in God that other people will not experience. So I'm going to talk to you tonight and the rest of this weekend about God's desire, God's willingness, God's ability to flat out prosper you. Notice I'm not being sneaky. I'm not trying to be subtle. He wants you rich. Yeah. You okay? okay. <laughs> I'm not going to be subtle about it. Because I believe it's, it's upon us, Joel, 
others of, of our generation and the ones around us and really anybody who wants in on this thing. It's upon us to be bold about what the Word of God says. And I'm excited about it. I, I for one, am excited about my generation getting a hold of the revelation of God's will and desire and ability to prosper them because I believe I am a part of a genuinely and uniquely generous generation. I see a generosity in those people my age, a little younger, a little older. I see, a, I see an authentic generosity in them. And, and uh, not just a willingness to give, it's there, but it's like a, almost a second nature to it. We very gladly would give to each other. I, I see that going on. I don't know if you see it. And I don't know if I see it as much naturally, as much as I do spiritually, or maybe it's both. I really don't know. But I'm telling you, I see it. I see that. And it excites me to think what could happen if great big truckloads of money ended up in the hands of people who loved God and loved others enough to find out from God, what do you want done with this? That excites me because we can impact some people with that. And I think the people of Impact Live Church should be at least a little interested in impacting the lives of other people. But that's what, that's what stirs me up about it. When I think about God's, his desire to see you and I prosperous, live and blessed in every area of our lives, I get excited about it because I start seeing the impact that that could have. Yeah. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. So, again, I know I'm taking a long time to set this up, but he, but he, the elder John, said, I pray that in all things you'd prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. The thing I so appreciate about the generations and the elders, if you will, Pastor John, Pastor Ingrid, those who have laid a foundation, hear elder, but don't hear old. Can, are we okay? Don't hear that. That's not what it is. It's, this, it's the assignment on your lives, your lives to do what you've done, which is to build something and lay a foundation and, and build on that foundation. And just like we've said, to, to refuse to quit when daily opportunities presented themselves. The thing I so admire and so appreciate about our elder, elders in that generation is if you stop and listen to them, listen, especially, especially to those who are like what we're talking about here with John, who are in that season of their lives when things are, are, when there are more days behind them than maybe days in front of them, if you'll stop and listen, you'll hear wisdom that you probably won't hear or find anywhere else. You'll hear from them things that uncover true riches, things of real value. And I think... This is probably one of the biggest discrepancies when you start comparing generation to generation, young age to older age. It's a real difference in what we see as valuable. Yeah. Yeah. I, I started talking to our three-year-old, Jesse. She's three. She'll be four later this summer. I told her just a week or two ago, I was having her do something like, if you'll do this, I'll do this for you kind of thing. <clears throat> I said, I don't know what it was, but I said... I'll tell you what, if you'll do this, I'll give you a choice. I'll give you either a sucker or a thousand dollars. Guess what she picked? Yes. Sucker. <laughs> and I knew she would. I knew she would. That was the whole joke. Was that I knew that's exactly what she would pick. She picked candy over a thousand dollars. Why? What's she want with a thousand bucks? What am I going to do with that? I'll try to put it in my mouth, but you're going to tell me to take it out. I can't eat that. Give me that sucker. Come on, where's it at? Somebody help me out. Is there a difference, maybe a small one at least, in what we see as valuable from the time we're little and as we grow and we grow and we grow? And then they start to get a little sense of some of the things we call valuable, and it's like, oh, 
a dollar? <gasps> you know, they just get, it's, they don't realize yet. The, the value system is still different. They're still learning it. It's still growing. Paul said it best like when he said it like this, when I was a child, I thought like one. I talked like one. I understood like a child. But when I became a man, now here's what I like about this verse. It's 1 Corinthians 13. When I became a man, he said, when I grew up, you know, he could have said, when I grew, when I grew up, I grew out of childish things. But that's not what he said. When I became a man, I put away childish things. There are things in our lives that as we grow from one age to another, from one generation, we're always in our own generation, but we become, we go from being the young generation to the elder generation. There are things in that process that must be put away. There are some things we grow out of, yes, but other things, if they're not put away, they'll hang around forever. And there are, some, there are some ways of speaking as a child, thinking as a child, understanding as a child, that if you don't put them away, they will be with you till the day you die. And there is some of these, some of these things that children look at and they think are so valuable, suckers, <laughs> balloons, <laughs> you know, stuff that is here one moment and gone the next, this kind of thing. Well, there are some things that that childish way, I'll say it to you like this, that childish way of assigning value to things. If you don't learn to put that away, yeah, maybe you grow out of wanting suckers as much as you used to, but still there's a fundamental shift and a change that has to take place when it comes to putting value on something. You have to help me with this tonight. It's so, most of these things I've never really said like this before. <clears throat> what I believe we're seeing here through the words of the elder John is he's putting value where it belongs. He said, I, pr I pray that you'd prosper and be in health. But there's a key to it here that he revealed to us. Because when most people hear prosper, immediately they think, Outward prosperity, money, stuff, house, car, clothes, stuff you can touch, stuff you can see, stuff you can feel, all the stuff you look at what somebody else has and you make the assessment about how, watch this now, well they're doing. Are these not the words we use? Look how well that guy's doing. Yeah, but how do you know? How do you know he's doing well? Well, look at the stuff. Jesus said one's life is not measured in the abundance of what he possesses. Right. Life's not measured in the things that you own. That's, right. That's what he was saying. So if we're using the stuff to measure how well we're doing, we're using the wrong stick. Yeah, right. yeah. And sometimes it takes the voice of an elder. It takes the voice of one who used to think like that. Who used to talk like that. Who used to understand just like you do, just like I do. Sometimes it takes the voice of an elder to say, yeah, prosperity's right. Prosperity's good. Health, absolutely, valuable. But he said, I pray that you prosper and be in health. And he drew his attention right back to how your soul is prospering. How many people, they think prosperity, but neglect to think about what's going on inside. This is the voice of an elder speaking, a man who's in the closing days, weeks, months, maybe years of his life, and it's as though I hear my own grandfather, my own great-grandfather saying to you, boy, listen to me, let me tell you what's really valuable. I see you seeking all this other stuff. The stuff's fine. I want to tell you something. The stuff comes, the stuff goes. Let me tell you what's really valuable. And he said, I'm praying that you prosper even as your soul prospers. Now, there's a lot that's been said about our prosperity and prospering in God, and so much of the time we bring it back to our giving. 
And, and that's good. There, there, it, you, you don't prosper in God without giving. That's his prescribed way of increase. But I'm going to tell you something. There is, there is a way. You can kill yourself giving. You can go broke giving. And it do nothing for you. It matters the motivation you're giving with. And that, my friend, is a soul issue. That is what's going on inside. You can tithe every day, every week of your life, but if you do it in fear, if you do it afraid, oh, I got to do this or he won't rebuke the devourer. He won't rebuke the devourer. He won't rebuke. You're paying the mob. That, that's, that's the depth of your revelation right there. That's the depth of, of, of your revelation of tithing. And there's nothing greater about it than you might as well just be paying the mafia to protect your stuff. And that's a soul issue. That's an issue with what's going on inside you. I'll tell him I'll call him back. I don't know. <laughs> so you can see it comes back to this. You can see that prospering in our souls may have more to do with our prosperity than we've realized or that we've spent time thinking on or praying about or growing in a revelation of. He's saying, I want you to prosper on the outside just like you are on the inside. Now, sometimes, <laughs> I said to you a moment ago, we've taken this verse and so isolated it that we don't gain the truth that we would if we just would stick it back in there. Some of you have little kids. How many times a day or a week do you say to them, put that back where you found it? Go put that back where you found it. What, what's the problem? They've taken something off a shelf or out of a room or out of its right place, right? And you're concerned they're going to do something with it that is either going to hurt it or them, and you're going to have to buy it or whatever. Go put it back where you found it. Go put it back where you found it. Well, you know, I believe there are times that if you listen, the Holy Spirit will say to you with these verses that we have just grown up, taken out of context and taken isolating them, he'll say, hey, hey, listen, go put that back where you found it and let it speak even more to you. So if you put it back where you found it, the next verse, he said, for I rejoiced greatly when brethren came and testified of the truth that is in you, just as you walk in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children Walk in the truth. So in two verses, we have truth three times. So John writing back to him, and he's writing to Gaius in response to what he heard about him. People who had been present with this individual, and I don't know a lot about him. Wikipedia didn't say too much about it, so I don't know too much about it. <clears throat> but I do know what John wrote. He said, people came back and told me all about you. They told me <clears throat> about the truth that's in you. That's where? In you. They told me about the truth that's in you and the truth that you're walking in. And he said, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking <clears throat> in the truth. So when he said to him, I pray that you're that you would prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. He was saying, I love what I hear is going on in you. Yeah. I found out from these people that your soul is thriving. Your soul is healthy. Your soul is strong. Your soul is prospering. Why? Because the truth made its way in you. Somewhere along the way, this guy... Gaius, whoever he is, heard some of the same stuff that you and I have heard. Somebody preached the gospel to him. Somebody opened the word to him. Somebody preached with revelation to him. And he heard it. He saw it. And it got in him. And he accepted it as the truth. Was it the psalmist said, thy word is truth. So your soul prospers when the word is getting in and getting in and getting in and the truth is in you and the truth is working in you and you are walking in the truth. And John heard this about this guy and he said, you know what, I'm going to pray for you. 
Well, sorry, he's a little older than that. I'm, I'm going <laughs> to... Probably wasn't all snappy like that. Might have been, I don't know. <coughs> but John said, I'm going to pray this for you. <clears throat> I'm going to pray that the prosperity I see going on in you is going to start making its way outside. Yeah. I'm going to pray that how healthy you are inside is going to start making its way outside. How many of you would love some of your elders to be praying this for you? I, I value that more than anything. I had a conversation with my grandfather just a few weeks ago. And he truly is my elder. My elder, not just physically or biologically, but in faith. And he called me in response to a partner letter I had written. I wrote something in there that got him stirred up. He was excited about it. He called me to let me know. And he said, Jeremy, I want to be a better partner to you. He's one of the strongest partners I've got. <laughs> He said, I'm going to be a better partner to you. I said, I said, Papa, thank you so much. You have no idea what that means to us. I said, but the most valuable thing that Sarah and I could get from you guys is your faith, your wisdom, because you have been where we are, lived to tell about it. I, I, need you, I need you doing exactly what you're doing right now. Call me. Speak to me. Pray for me. And the reason I can say that to him and say it with all honesty is because I've had a shift in my thinking. That man's value, that man's money is not as valuable to me as that man's faith. Now, it takes the Holy Spirit going to work in your soul for you to be able to say something like that. But I can stand here and say it to you with confidence, with a clean heart. In all sincerity, I'm not making stuff up. I would, I would rather have that man's faith than I would his money. Because there's been a shift in what's valuable to me. Am I making sense to you guys tonight? A shift in what's valuable. That's got to take place in us. If we're ever going to prosper on the level that God wants us prospering on, we are going to have to come into agreement with him on what is truly valuable. And we are going to have to prosper from the inside out. Everything in God is from the inside out. He doesn't do anything from the outside in. Everything in God... Everything in his kingdom, everything in his word, all change that ever takes place in the life of a believer always takes place from the inside out, never from the outside in. But everything in the system of the world, everything in the carnal world, everything in the world that is completely unaware of the Spirit of God, completely unaware that there even is such a thing that lives only by the dictates of the flesh, the senses. They live entirely from outside in. And I'm going to tell you something. The Lord even adjusted that statement for me just today on the airplane coming here. He said it's not so much outside in as it is outside on. People, you remember what Jesus said it like this? After all these things the Gentiles seek, yeah. what things was he talking about? Your food, your clothing, stuff that seems like all important. He said, there's got to be a difference between them and you. There's got to be a difference. If they're seeking that, you seek the kingdom. And all these things will be added to you. But when they add to themselves, it's not actually getting in. They just add it from the outside on. It's what shows up outside. But it is not an indicator of how well they're doing. You'd have to be able to look at the soul to know that. The Lord showed this to me one time in a really crystal clear picture. 
we were flying in an airplane. I think it was our airplane at the time. And we would pulled up somewhere, I think, to get fuel. And we pulled over to the FBO. That's the fixed base operations there where you, you, you get fuel and <clears throat> whatnot. And out there on the ramp, parked just a little way from us, was this giant Gulf Stream. I don't know if anybody's familiar with a Gulf Stream. And these are, these are kind of the, the granddaddy of private jet aviation. This was, a, I don't know, Gulf Stream 4, something like that. It's big. Maybe G3, G4. Big, big airplane. Painted jet black. No pun intended. Just jet black. <laughs> And the, uh, the staircase was open, and you could tell from where we were, the hand railing go going up the staircase was gold. And we started asking the guys about it, and they were telling the guys, I mean, the, the guys doing the fuel and the guys managing the ramp and so, so on, telling us about the airplane, like, everything inside is gold, and, like, not just gold-looking, <laughs> gold. And you look at that, you look at a piece of equipment like that, I mean, you're talking tens of millions of dollars. And that's just to buy it. That's just to buy it. Then to operate it, to own it, to fuel it up. I mean, you're talking about so much, millions of dollars on an annual basis. I mean, when you, when you break a windshield wiper on one of these things, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it is a lot of money. And you might step back and look at that and think, man, Whoever that guy is, he is doing well. He is doing well. But then we started asking, whose is it? Who owns that? And they told us who it was. And this man was, and maybe still is to this day, one of the leading pioneers in the pornography industry. Let me ask you something. Is he doing well? That airplane, that business built on the backs of slavery and addiction and abuse, belittling women, minimizing, manipulating, hurting, harming, wounding, scarring, roping men and others into addiction that maybe they never managed to break free of. That's what bought that piece of equipment. Is he doing well? That's a soul issue. Is this, is this clear? See, you can't judge by the stuff, can you? Church, we can't be guilty of trying to judge by the stuff. You hear somebody talk to you about prosperity you got to say, help me, Holy Ghost, not to just start thinking stuff, 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 yeah. stuff, stuff. Yeah. Because the stuff, here's the thing about things. They're just things. Yeah. And that's the thing with things. They're just things. <laughs> Stuff's just stuff. But you put that same piece of equipment in the hands of a man or a woman committed to preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ from the top of the world to the bottom and all the way around who will keep that thing in the air full of preachers, full of missionaries, full of medical missions and doctors and people taking help into disaster areas all over the world. That person is doing well. They both have the same piece of equipment it's back to a soul issue. It's back to a motive issue. It's back to what's going on inside. See, somebody else, you can amass a bunch of stuff, but if it didn't come from the inside out, it just came from the outside on, then that's not prosperity. Some people are so poor that all they have is a bunch of money, and that's all they got. Can you tell maybe we've got some mind renewal to do about some of these things? changing the way we think about finances, changing the way we think about prosperity. The elder said this, telling us what is truly, truly valuable, what's going on inside. Thank you, Lord. Go to the book of Proverbs with me. Proverbs chapter 11, I believe. 
<clears throat> Look at verse 24. There is one who scatters, yet increases more. And there is one who withholds more than is right, but it leads to poverty. So he's comparing two different ones. So there's one who does this and there's one who does that. I'm going to compare them to you. There's one who scatters and yet he increases. And you talk about renewing your mind. You talk about changing the way you think. This is so opposite of the natural inborn DNA and it is completely opposite to the way this natural world thinks that if you want to have anything and if you want to increase in anything, you better hold on with a death grip to every nickel and dime that comes your way because if you start losing them, you don't know when you're going to get them back. And that's a soul issue. And really what it is, it, it all comes back down to this. Always, it always comes back down to the difference between faith and fear. All the time. What would keep somebody from taking some of what they've got and scattering it? That's the picture that seed sowing paints, scattering that seed. There is one who says that scatters. And the world will tell you, hold on to that. What are you doing? Don't throw that out there. What do you mean you gave it away? They have such a hard time wrapping their brain around giving it away. But you and I don't struggle with it as much. Why? Because our value system has started to change. There's some re mind renewal that has taken place, and we used to think like that. Who, who does that remind you of? What, what demographic does that remind you of who, who gets something and just refuses to let go? Let, let me give you a hint. Mine. <laughs> Mine, 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 mine. It's like word number three that they learned growing up. Mine, 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 mine. He took mine. That's mine. Give it back. I want mine. And that is a childish mentality. Way childish, right? But if you don't put that away, that mine mentality will hang on to you and stick around with you way past childhood on up into your teenage years and 20s and 30s and 40s and way on till you are coming toward the end of this thing. And if you never put away mine, wow. then it's a childish way of thinking, a childish way of speaking, a childish way of understanding. To understand life and increase this way, that if I don't hold on to it, I won't get it, I won't have any more, I'll run out. That's childish. It's childish. How many times have you tried to convince your child, baby, we can get another one? Sweetheart, they make more. No matter what it is, I mean, we've talked about suckers and balloons and ice cream and, and all this stuff, and if they lose it or can't find it, sweetheart, it's okay. I got another one at the house. No! Ah! <laughs> Screaming and crying and throwing a fit. What is that? It's fear. Yeah. It's fear that they'll never have it again. It's fear that it's gone forever. And we laugh at it. We think, oh, that's, that's childish. Well, guess what else is childish? To hold on to that $8. What are we talking about? A, t a tithe, a 10% ten, ten a tenth. To hold on to that thing, white knuckled, with a grip that has become arthritic. And it would take a miracle, like Jesus with the man with the withered hand. How'd that hand get withered? You open it up and you see, oh, there was a quarter in it. But just holding on so tight to every nickel, dime, and dollar that comes through and the inability to scatter it, the inability to let go of it. What is that inability? It's a soul issue. It's fear. It's fear that I won't have it anymore. It's a constant fear of running out, running out, running out, running out. Fear there's not going to be enough. Fear if we do this, then we won't have enough for this. 
is fear. And yet the Bible gives us this whole other way of thinking. And he says, there's one who scatters and yet he increases. How are you going to explain that? Well, God explained it when he invented seed. And he put an entire tree in a seed. He put a whole human in a seed. He explained it perfectly. But it's a childish mind that can't understand that. They tend to think more like this. There's the one who withholds more than is right. But really what ends up happening is that leads to poverty. Verse 25 says this, the generous soul will be made rich. Will be made what? Rich. Will be made, huh? Rich. Will be, be made, come again now? Rich. rich. So sneaky, just sneaking in the prosperity <laughs> stuff in here. Rich. The Bible said it. The generous soul. Generosity is a condition of your soul. And it's got to start inside and make its way outside. The same thing that John was praying over Gaius when he found out truth is working in you. I found out you got a hold of some truth and you accepted truth and you're walking in truth. And John automatically knows he doesn't have to look at the man's bank account. He doesn't have to look at the house he's living in, the donkey he's riding on. He knows that's a prosperous man. Because I found out what's, what condition your soul's in. Yeah. Truth's in there. And he said, I'm going to pray this. That everything that's going on in you is going to start making its way to the outside. Yeah. And the same prosperity that's at work in you is now going to be at work outside here. And the inward condition is going to produce the outward one. Yeah. Yeah. That's how we increase in God. Now, there's any number of ways you can get rich. And all of them but one have nothing to do with God. But the scripture tells us in the book of Proverbs here that it's the blessing of the Lord. Yeah. It makes rich. But here's the big difference between it and all the rest of them. It adds no sorrow to it. The blessing of the Lord, having it produced from the inside out, that is the only way to become rich with no sorrow. Rich with no toil. See, this is why I tell people all the time, you have to be watchful over whose story you allow to inspire you. Because we love a good rags to riches story, don't we? So inspiring when you hear about this guy or this girl, this, they're born into nothing, had nothing, came from nothing. And now they have it all, multi, multi, multi-millionaire. You know, businesses all over the world, houses and cars and airplanes and boats and people are just so rich, 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 rich. We're so inspired by their stories. Well, I want you to go back and look at the story. Because it's not so much what they got, but how they got it. And if their story includes, you know, a bunch of different marriages a bunch of scorned children, no relationship with family, gone through a thousand and one different employees, different assistants, just burn them up. Why? Because one comes in and they just leave defeated 24 hours later because this person is just so hard and so harsh. And Don't let that story inspire you. Because that's not the blessing of the Lord that did that. The blessing of the Lord doesn't add to you and destroy your marriage. Uh, I don't know that you heard that as well as I <laughs> hoped you would. The blessing of the Lord does not make you rich and ruin your family. It doesn't do it. The blessing of the Lord will make you rich and your family will thrive and your relationships will thrive, and your joy will be intact, and your peace will be intact. That's prosperity. The generous soul will be made rich, and he who waters will also be watered himself. 
I want to give you one last example of this tonight. There's a lot more we could say about it, <clears throat> but we've got more time. Go to the book of Matthew. Lord, do we need to do that? Thank you, Lord. You know what? I think we'll save that. Go back to Proverbs. Let me show you just a few scriptures and we'll begin to wrap this up. I think this is what the Lord wants us to see tonight. Leaving this childish mentality of what, a misunderstanding of what is truly valuable. I, I, I pray and hope that's been clear tonight. Like I said, some of these things are still very fresh to me. So I'm trusting the Holy Spirit to minister this to you. But you know, children understand in a way they think in a way, they talk in a way that's fine and it's cute when they're children. But it's not as cute when the 50-year-old's going, mine, mine, <laughs> mine, give me, give me, give me, mine. It's not as cute when the 60-year-old is having to be told, you need to share. <laughs> you need to share. Not as cute. And the reason... Those mentalities would still be around. Number one, we've, just, we've seen it. You, you haven't put them away. The same thing would be true. I mean, I'm, and I'm standing in front of you 37 years old, and it's, it's not cute when it shows up in my life either. But the reason those things hang around is because somewhere along the way, we failed to see what is truly valuable. And if you're going to, going to increase God's way, you are going to, like I said a long time ago, Come into agreement with him on what is valuable. He is not opposed to you having some things, some nice things. Scripture tells us he's given us all things richly to enjoy. But before he can put those things in your hand, you've got to be able to answer two questions. Number one, can you trust him for it? Or are you going to look to yourself or others as your source? Number one, can you trust him for it? But like I said, there's another question, and it's this. Can he trust you with it? Because I don't believe he's going to put something in your hands that he can't trust you with. And I really think that's probably where we'll go tomorrow in our time together. But we've got to understand money has to be in its right place. We have to have a right relationship with money. For him to bring more money to us, more money to our churches, more money to our outreaches, more money to our families, more money to the assignment, more money to the vision, for him to bring that to us, he must know that we have an appropriate relationship with money. That's why I don't love it, because that'd be a wrong relationship with it. I'm not in love with money. We shouldn't love it. And we know that the love of money is the root of all evil. But you go back sometime, and maybe through the course of the weekend, we'll get back to it. That's there in 1 Timothy 6. And you just look at some of the words that surround that. Put it back where you found it. And he's, he's writing to them there, even in the verse before it, and talking about that those who crave to be rich. That word crave is, is um, the same as the word lust. A lusting for it. He said, for which many have, uh, they have strayed from faith. They've strayed from it. I want you to just take note of how many different words used in talking about money would also be used in talking about an adulterous affair. Lust, straying, like a man or a woman who has strayed from their spouse. They've, what did it say? They've strayed and they've left the faith. That's an unfaithful partner. It talks about being drawn away into temptation. I mean, all, all these words, all it boils down to is a wrong relationship with money. You know what it is? It's a financial affair. It's an affair. You had to leave your first love so that you could live with money as your love. And it's a wrong relationship with it. And God certainly cannot bless that or increase that. That's a financial affair. It's cheating on God. Can I be bold enough to say it to you like that? It's cheating 
on the one who gave it to you. So we're going to have to learn to put it in its right place. And in the closing moments of this message tonight, let me just give you a few scriptures that will help you understand through the eyes of God where money fits in importance and in value. Proverbs chapter 15. Look at verse 16. It says this, better. Somebody say better. Better, better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure with trouble. Now that's a shift in your thinking right there, isn't it? And the, the natural carnal man would have no frame of reference for that whatsoever and would argue with you day and night. You're telling me it's better to have little, little to no money, as long as I have, what do you call it now? The fear of the Lord, as opposed to having great treasure. They said it's better to have little with the fear of the Lord than to have great treasure and trouble. So in the eyes of God, is money important? Yeah. Is it most important? No. Right. Here's something we see that's more valuable. The fear of the Lord. Now, that's a soul issue. Yeah. Can you see that? Yeah. We're going to look at several of these, but I want you to take note of how many times they come back to soul issues. Yeah. The fear of the Lord. The worshipful, reverential awe of who He is and what He is. Yeah and all he's done, and all he's capable of. He's saying, it would be better, you'd be better off to have five bucks to your name and that than you would to have a million dollars just sitting in the account with a bunch of trouble in your life. It's better. So this is a shift. We're putting away some childish ways of thinking right now. Go now. Just a couple of pages over, chapter 17. Look at verse 1. Better, say it again, better. Better, better is a dry morsel. Hmm, that sounds delicious, doesn't it? <laughs> a dry morsel with quietness than a house full of feasting with strife. Better. Better. Jesus answered this one when he said life is more than food. You telling me it's better to sit down at the dinner table and all I have is a, not even a full bowl of granola, just like a couple <laughs> flakes of it? A dry morsel. It's better to have that, he said, with quietness. Quietness. We dropped our children off of Sarah's parents on the way to Canada. We have so much quietness <laughs> right now. No, it's not what I'm talking about. You know what he's talking about. He's talking about peace. Yeah. Did you know peace is more valuable than money? Yeah. Way, way yeah. more valuable. Yeah. Peace. Quietness inside. This is a soul issue, yeah. is it not? It's better to sit down at the table with barely anything there and just be so calm, be so at rest on the inside, just to have your whole heart just filled and overflowing with the peace of God, and not just peace on the inside, but peace that has made its way from the inside to the outside and living in a house with peace. Yeah. A small house with peace is far more valuable far more valuable than a mansion with strife. But how many people wouldn't make that trade if you gave them the choice? Small house peace, big house strife. I'll take the house. But how many people who have that house and the strife would trade it all for just a little bit of quietness? And how many have? How many people who have taken their own lives because they, got, they could get no quietness? Constant turmoil inside. Regardless of what they, the size of the place they were living in, what they were driving, how much was in the account, couldn't get any peace. And in a last-ditch effort 
to just shut out the noise, they took their own life. I'm not trying to be over dramatic. I'm not trying to be heavy. These, these, this is happening to people all over the world every day. It's better. It is more peace is more valuable than money. So that to think like that, you got to put away some childish ways of thinking. It's better to have a dry morsel with quietness than a house full of feasting with strife. Strife. I don't care how much money you have. It's just not worth having that in your life. And we, in our house, in our ministry, we have a no strife policy. And when Sarah and I, we, we have our, a fuss or an argument or something, by the grace of God and the help of the Holy Spirit, we shut that thing down as quickly as we can. And we don't let it drag on day after day after day. We don't let it become the atmosphere in our home. We repent for letting it get in even that much because it's just not worth it. Now, here's the cool thing when you look at all of these. This, these are not either-or scenarios. It's not either peace, you either have peace or money. I told you, the blessing of the Lord will give you both. The blessing of the Lord will give you both. Let's see, there's another one here. Go to chapter 19. He says in verse 1, Better, better is the poor who walks in his integrity than one who is perverse in his lips and is a fool. Did you know integrity is more valuable than money? But what is integrity? That's a soul issue, isn't it? To stand by your word, to swear to your own hurt, to say something and actually mean it. You'd be better off being poor with integrity than you would be being a rich liar. Because in the eyes of God, the man with all the money, if he's nothing but a liar, that's not prosperity. Prosperity is a soul condition. But the blessing of the Lord will give you both. Amen? Look at verse 22. What is desired in a man is kindness. And a poor man is better than a liar. What is desired in a man is kindness. But this is a mature way of thinking. Young girls, when they make their lists, what they want Prince Charming to look like and be like, and I mean, what makes the top ten every time? Rich. I want him to be but you know what you really should want? A kind man. Ladies, listen to me. Young women, listen to me. If there are any in here tonight that dream of being married one day, this should be at the very top of your list. Father, bring me a kind man. A man who will speak to me in kindness. A man who won't be harsh with his words. A man won't be harsh in his actions. I want kindness. And then keep making your list and on down at the bottom somewhere, yeah, put rich on there. <laughs> but it's not more valuable than kindness. And kindness, you know what issue that is? That's a soul issue. That comes from the inside out. What's desired in a man is kindness. And a poor man is better than a liar. There was, a, there was another one of these. Did I read it to you? Maybe it was in chapter 15. Oh, there's so many more. Let me just give you this last one. I like it so much. Go back to 15. We looked at verse 16. This is my favorite one. Verse 17. We looked at chapter 15, verse 16. Now look at verse 17. Better <clears throat> is a dinner of herbs where love is than a fatted calf with hatred. I looked at this, my Bible here has a little footnote where it says herbs, and the footnote is vegetables. <laughs> that means something to me. It's literally saying, look, it's better to sit down at a salad with someone who loves you and someone you love 
than it is to sit at a stake with hatred between you. And men, we talked to ladies a moment ago, men, let's, let's talk about this for a second. If you had to choose, if you had to choose, men, men of Red Deer, if you had to choose what was put in front of you tonight at the table, would it be a leafy green salad or a nice thick filet? Show me, it's the meat, right? Where's the beef? I want the meat. But there's something more valuable. And in all of these things, again, they're just, they're, they're pictures to paint, you know, somebody sitting down with nothing to eat but what they've grown in their garden. It's simple. It's, it's not pricey. It's not expensive. It's not fancy. It's not the fatted calf. It's not the most choice cut of meat. It's not the high dollar steak. He said, but here's what's more valuable. Love at the table. I mean, how many things have we just listed here? Love. Peace, integrity, kindness, truth, all of these things, and there's so many more, all of them are more valuable than money. All of them are greater than gold. And all of them are soul issues, which says to me, if we'll get these things right, if we'll get these things first, and our souls start to prosper, it's only a matter of time between now and when that prosperity going on in here starts showing up out here. I would much rather have a salad with a woman who loves me than a steak with someone who can't stand me. I heard a couple, a couple of comedians one time talking, and they were driving in a car talking to each other, and they were talking about this very thing like, talking about a meal or talking about some food they had. They're like, did you, did you like that meal? They were both at the same party. He's like, you know what? I think anytime you're eating with somebody you get along with, it's a good meal. And that sounds so simple. It sounds so blasé, you know, so passé. There's some real truth to it. I think our dinner tables ought to be more protected. This ought to be a really safe place for our families to sit down because the love that's being passed back and forth between us far more valuable than how fancy this food is how organic how what, what are the other terms vegan <laughs> how sugar-free gluten-free as my dad would say taste free <laughs> We make a real big deal out of these things sometimes. And are they important? Sure. But they are not more important than the love, the peace, the quietness, the truth, the integrity. All of these things outweigh all the money in the world. That's why you and I have to make a choice before the Lord. When we go before him and we say, Father, we're... We're trusting you for increase. We're believing you for income. But we have got to let him know and let ourselves know. This money that we're trusting you for is not the most important thing. And we're going to have to give attention to what is truly valuable. Because the lesser is always swallowed up in the greater. And if we get these things the way they're supposed to be, like I said, just a amount of time, we start prospering on the outside. Amen. Does this make sense to you tonight? I think we're going to increase in this. Sarah, do you have anything you need to add to any song or anything at all? Joel, would you come up here, man? I just want to close this out. You guys have been patient with me tonight. Are you excited about the rest of this weekend? Man, I just want to say to you and Jamie that Sarah and I are really, we are excited to see the growth and we're excited to see the increase of the church. We're excited to see the increase of your ministry and what the Lord has already done with the two of you guys and the greater things that are still to come. But as members of the same generation, man, I just, I want to, if you would allow me, commission you in front of your people to preach with boldness the, the truth of the word and what it's going to take to increase God's way. And if you guys will be bold to preach it, You'll see it. Oh, and 
I don't know if what that other pastor told me is true or not. I don't know if <laughs> Canadians are really all that opposed to... I don't care if the whole rest of the country is. Let them look at Red Deer. Let them look at this place. And let them say, you're not supposed to prosper like that there. You're, you, that's not supposed to happen there. And then you tell them why. Amen? All right. It's going to be a good, good weekend, man. All right. Awesome, awesome. Amen. Oh, that was good. You enjoyed it this evening. Man, oh man, that's awesome. Well, you know, we're actually going to receive a, an offering this morning for this whole Legacy Weekend and what the Lord is going to continue to do. And actually, I, I just love, he, he kind of preached the whole offering message as well at the same time. And But I, I just really appreciate it. Just Proverbs 11, what he said, one who scatters. And I actually just, just had this picture of even just holding my wallet and just having this mindset. Oh, that's, that was for you, Jeremy. That's all, it's all here. It's yours, man. It's yours. The MasterCard never says no. So... But just having that mindset of just, I mean, we did that a little while ago here as a church family. Just, we, we don't serve money. We serve God. And we know we kind of, we dressed up and we had a nice apron on and we're, we're res, who are we responding to? Right? Are we responding to money? Is money dictating to us what we can and cannot do? Or is God the one telling us what we can and cannot do? And we've, we've determined as a church family and as Impacting Canada Ministries that it's the Lord that is going to be determining what we do, not finances. Right? He's told us to reach Canada, in Canada, for Canada. We're going to do it. It's not based on what money says, not based on what the bankers say or what the account looks like. It's based on what the Lord has told us. And you all know that I'm preaching to the choir. But <clears throat> I want to just share something with you real quickly, a little bit about actually why, why we're here uh, this is not your typical, you know, offering message that people are kind of used to and expecting. Uh, but uh, one of Impacting Canada Ministries, one of our main focuses as a ministry here is to be a distribution center of the word in every form. We are so passionate, we are so hungry and determined to get the word out. We want to get the word out in any possible way that we can do it. And one of the ways that we do it is having a weekend like this, able to come in and hear the word of the Lord, hear what... Um, ministers and what what they want to say what they have on their hearts for them to speak to us and that's one way that we do it and uh, i just want to just let me just follow up where i'm going here so what we want to do this evening is on purpose and this whole entire weekend is i want you just to hook up with us i mean this isn't just a few people's vision this is us as a nation us as pastors and leaders of other churches we're here in canada for canada and what we're interested in doing is getting the word out and one of the ways, as I said, we can do that is this, but I want you to hook up with us. I want to be in, in unison together to reach the nation of Canada to get the word out. I mean, as kind of what Jeremy was mentioning with some of the, the TV stuff that you see here. Yeah, this being broadcasted, we want to get this message out. We want to get the word out to reach generations, right? And as I said, that's what we're doing here. But to reach unreachable groups, we need to do things that have never done before, but also now together in unity. It's no longer, and it's so cool to see actually different parts of Canada here as well and other nations. It's not longer you and your area and, my and me and my area. It's we're united. We're one. It's one nation, one purpose, one family, like Jeremy was saying. It's the church of Jesus Christ around the world globally that we're part of. And in Genesis 11, 4 through 6, I just love this, and you know it. It's when God came down to see with the Tower of Babel what they were doing. And he said, come, let's, or these are what the people said, come, let's build a great city for ourselves with a tower that reaches into the sky. This will make us famous and keep us from being scattered all over the world. But the Lord came down to look at the city and the tower the people were building. Look, he said, the people are united and they all speak the same language. After this, nothing they set out to do will be impossible for them. So what's impossible for us? Nothing if we're united. So what we want to do is we want to take our finances, our resources that we have, and we want to unite it for one purpose. It's not just, oh, this, I'm, going to, I'm expecting this, I'm expecting that. And listen, you can have all that, but kind of what Jeremy is even saying, the lesser is swallowed up by the greater. What's the greater? To get the word out. That's our heart. That's the passion. That's why we're here as a ministry and as an organization is we want to get the word out to everyone that's breathing on this planet. So when you sow and when you give your finances this evening, that's what it's going towards, going towards a whole legacy weekend. We want to be a big blessing to PMI. Uh, we believe we're standing with them. We're so for them and the call that God has on their lives as well. So there's offering envelopes directly in front of you. If you're writing checks, you can make it out to um, Impacting Canada Ministries. And then you will, if you need debit or credit, it's all just outside this door, actually. And cash works. 
loonies, toonies, euros, uh, it's pesos, I don't know, but what, what, it all, it's all good. <laughs> but we want to honor the Lord with it as well. So if you got your offerings, let's just, if you don't mind just holding it up. So Father, we thank you so much for the word that we received this evening. We are grateful for the word that was spoken to us. We receive it, and we're not just going to be hearers of it, but we are doers of your word as well. Lord, we thank you for it, and we call this meeting blessed. We call our finances blessed, and as it goes across to impact generations for Jesus, goes across to reach, train, and to unite the nations of Canada, the United States, and worldwide, Lord, we give you praise for it, and we honor you with these finances this evening. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen, amen. You may go ahead, and we'll receive our offerings, and I'll give it over to my beautiful wife to give you some instruction. Isn't she gorgeous? I mean, I... I, I knew when I married her, I didn't just marry up in age. I married up in, in beauty and everything. I just had to let everyone know, you know, just, she is a fantastic, my sweetie. Oh, so sweet. We'll talk later. But we, but we don't have any strife in our home, so. <laughs> oh, my wonderful husband. Well, you just heard a little bit about Impact in Canada Ministries. You'll hear a little bit more tomorrow night. But while we're receiving the offering, I wanted to give you um, a heads up on a few cool things that are happening here in Canada. Our Bible school is getting revamped and relaunched and is going to be kicking off again this coming September. It's called Impact You. These are out on the table at the front. There's a table for um, Impact Life Church and Impact in Canada Ministries if you want more info. Um, and it's going to be held here, pr most likely we're thinking midweek, and it's going to be one night a week. So if you just want to get immersed in the word, but you work full time, this is for you. It's going to be wonderful. We're so excited to get the Bible school back up and running that Pastor John and Ingrid launched that I'm a graduate of. Look how, how and Joel too, it really benefited us. Um, also, if there are young people in here, or if you know young people, or if you think you're young, uh, maybe you fit into this category, but we have a discipleship program just for youngins. Um, we've got a couple of graduates or one right here, one in the second row. These guys, I mean, look, they're here on a Friday night, just so hungry for the word. Part of that has been this program. The heart is training up pursuers of God's heart. So if you know a young person, grab one of these. There's a, some on the info table out there as well, because it's going to be kicking off in the fall. And these guys, not only do they get discipleship courses, mentorship, internship, they actually get to go to the Bible school too. So it's going to be wonderful. Just some instruction for tomorrow. Tomorrow night at 7 is open to all. Now that you've been here tonight, maybe you've never heard Jeremy and you're like, hey, that guy's not as scary as I thought. And he's actually pretty funny. Bring a friend with you. It's going to be awesome. The Connect Lounge will open tomorrow at 6.30 for tea and coffee. And then tomorrow morning is just for ministers, pastors, and your team. You'll be here at 10.30. Connect Lounge opens at 10. So thank you for joining us. Stay mingle. In the back, yes. All right, we love you. Thank you for coming. We'll see you tomorrow.
was, am I living it? Do I live in it? So astounding. Love is an ocean, you can drown me. The sweet embrace, the lovely taste, I taste and see. I'm under grace, the place to be. It means I'll never need an umbrella. I'm cool in the cold, in the hot weather. Whether or never I ever understand I'm a man in the hands of great plans. I stand with faith and a life I never know to touch. And still I stop a clutch, but I'm like, what's the dream of? What's the hope in? What's the love for? Live to no end. This is living the life I'm in.